importantly, how you view submission. And so let's go directly into our text, and we're going to spend some time in prayer and ask God to bless our time together. And then we're going to excavate this text as we engage in another aspect of spiritual maturation. Let's pray. Our Father and our Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the divine assignment that you have given me. And I decrease so that you may increase. I pray that you would speak through my lips, think through my mind. Let there be none of me, all of you. Bless those that hear. Give them a greater understanding of the stages of spiritual maturation. Let each person be able to identify and locate themselves so that they can participate and be cooperative with the process that they are in. I pray that you would bless this word and that no one that hears this word will remain in the same realm or at the same level that they started out in. I pray that the anointing will break yokes. Bless our time together. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. I pray that tonight they, they will have a capacity building experience. Father, let them hunger and thirst after righteousness so that they can be filled. We thank you, oh God, for the leaders that you are raising up in this generation. And we pray, oh God, that nothing about their lives will be set. Sabotage. Father, we give you praise and honor and glory for thine is the kingdom, thine is the power, and thine is the glory. Let everyone say amen. amen. If you still have a praise in your heart, let's just worship the Lord. Let's just acknowledge his presence. In the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. Hallelujah. Let's raise our hands and let's elevate the King of kings and the Lord of lords in Jesus' name. Amen. We're excited tonight. We want you to take out your iPads, your notepads, your uh, iPhones, whatever you've got to take notes. And we want you to take very, very copious notes and really understand tonight is a destiny altering night is a destiny changing night and if you can just fully embrace what God is saying and have a complete understanding of the relevance of this for your life your life is about to change for the best and God is going to take you into unlimited realms of authority and power in the days to come turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 2 Luke chapter 2. And I just want to read from uh, verse number 43, and we'll have an opportunity to really go from verse 43 to 45 later on in the message and later on in the text. But we want to start out here. The scripture says in the book of Luke 2, 43 to uh, Luke 2, 43, it says, and when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, or their son tarried behind. Now, that's that word, pais, pais, pais. In our previous teachings, we learned that there are several stages of sonship, which I call the eight stages of spiritual maturation. One of the things that Peter encourages all of us is to embrace the process of spiritual maturation. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, he instructs us, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul became one of the greatest spiritual giants in the history of Christianity because he embraced the process. He said in 1 Corinthians 13 and 11, he said, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, a part of the spiritual process of maturation simply means that there are some things that you will pray away, but most things you have to put away. A lot of times we hold on to things because we don't realize that there is something better. But if you hold on to good, the better will never come. And if you hold on to better, the best will never come. There are some things you pray aside and other things you put aside. And Paul was able to say, I was able to put aside, lay aside, or throw away my childhood scripts so that God could replace it with adult strategies. And this is a season of strategy. And I'm learning more and more 
as I begin to consecrate myself for this generation and for what God is doing in this season, I recognize how many people are not successful because they lack strategy. They're not successful, not because they're not talented or gifted or anointing. It all boils down to strategy. What I'm decreeing and declaring over your life right now is that God is going to upgrade your strategies. I decree that you are going to willingly let go of your childhood scripts. And I decree and declare, as you trust God in this process, you are going to be endowed with strategy. You're going to have health strategies, financial strategies, relationship strategies, domestic strategies, marriage strategies. I decree and declare you are coming into a season of strategy. If you believe it, shout, I believe it. Now, when we talk about uh, where we are now, even in terms of humanity, even in terms of what God is doing in the body of Christ, humanity is currently waiting for the church to matriculate through the process of maturity. It's Romans 8, 19 that says, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. In other words, humanity is standing on its tiptoed waiting for the church to finally figure out who she is. The church is suffering from an identity crisis, and it's because we really don't know who we are. This morning when you awaken and when you left your house, the grass that you walked on knew who you were. The sun that was shining knew who you were. The question that I'm asking you today, do you know who you are and where you are? Now, when it comes to spiritual maturation, there are eight stages of spiritual maturation. And today we are going to focus on the fifth stage of spiritual maturation. And that is that stage called Pais. Pais. P-A-I-S. Pais. And it, 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 it simply it is, it is, is, is a designation of a child who is between the ages of 7 and 12. That pais is usually between the ages of 7 and 12. And it has the connotation of a, ch a young child between the ages of 7 and 12 being disciplined in order to mature. And so nobody likes to be disciplined, especially if you recall being 7 to 12, the ages of 7 to 12, and you were insisting, I'm not a baby anymore. And this is when your parents began to load in responsibilities. And oftentimes there were things that you didn't want to do. You are going to go to bed. You are going to read. You are going to clean your room. You are not going to talk that way. You are going to obey me. This is when... The, the stage of discipline is important. Now, why is this important? And I want to take a step back before I go forward. When we talk about the levels of discipline, the key position for an individual that is in this stage is to be in a, in a, in a position of submission. And so tonight, if I were to uh, give this message a title, I will entitle it The Protocol of Submission. The protocol of submission. Now, this is a very, very important stage. All of the stages are important, but this is the most important. And one of the reasons why this is important, because this is a stage that will teach you discipline of mind, refinement of temperament, and the control over your emotions by doing what you are told without grumbling and without complaining or without passive aggression, acting one way, but mentally resisting and rebellion. Now, this is important because it is a stage that you are going to learn the principles of cause and effect and trial and error. This is why the discipline is important. You cannot do what you want to do if you're going to be used by God, and you cannot jump over this stage. If you jump over this stage, you are bored and you sabotage your own greatness. It means that you are looking at your future success and you are putting a gun to your future future success and you are killing it at, at point blank range. Now, this is important for everyone to understand because I want 
to teach the ideal of it, not the abuse of it, but I want to teach, I want to teach you the ideal scenario so that you can understand why it is that you submit to those that have authority over you. Now, submission has nothing to do with activity. It has to do with an attitude. And once you finally find out why this stage is important and why it is that even the individual Individuals that are, are charged by God to have a watch over your soul to whom you are responsible to why this is important for all people to understand both those that are in authority and those that are submitting to authority and I'm going to tell you why a, as we begin to excavate this S uh, submission is attached to succession so it has uh, uh, two expressions. Number one, the person who is in the position of authority to whom someone is submitted to. Number two, it has to do with the person that is submitting to the one that's in authority. Now, for the one that is in authority, it is imperative to understand to whom much is given, much is required. So the person who is in the position of authority has the responsibility to make sure that they get before God to deal with their insecurities. Because as a leader, the number one responsibility of a leader is to raise other leaders. That means that it's possible someone more talented, someone more gifted, someone more powerful might be called to submit to you. Now, if you have a leader that is insecure, what will happen is they will oppress, they will suppress, or even abuse the individual for fear that that individual might take their place. But it is impossible in the realm of the spirit for someone to take your place. That place only recognize your voice print and your footprints, and beside the realm of greatness has enough room for all of us. There's enough room for all of us. No one has to compete for one position. In other words, the world needs leaders, and the scarcest resource is leadership. We cannot have enough people functioning effectively and efficiently in the realm of leadership. We need more leaders. And so the leader first is not only tasked with, with, with walking in authenticity and maturity themselves, they are tasked with developing the skill of leadership with those that follow. Failure to do this simply means that a leader could possibly do great feats within their lifetime, but history will never record it. Another generation will rise up and never knew of the great feats that you did. You've got to remember now, submission is attached to succession. If you want, if you want your work to continue on, it simply means that you've got to embrace pais. You've got to be able to recognize the role that you were playing in the life of your mentorees, in the life of your followers. Now, this is important for parents. And it would, would have been great if you had this lesson while you were raising your children. To be able to recognize between, between 7 and 12, this is what I need to do with my daughter. This is what I need to do with my son. However, when it comes to spiritual, it still applies to your spiritual sons and daughters. This is what I need to do. This is when you don't allow them to get away with anything. And it's not about feelings. It's about the discipline of their mind and the refinement of their character. And it has nothing to do with feelings. A person cannot be promoted as long as they wear their feelings on their sleeves, as long as they have not mastered their emotion. God has given you power over your emotion. In other words, this is what this is what Paul said to his spiritual son, Timothy. God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and what? Soundness of mind. In other words, he was simply saying the grace that is upon 
upon you, Timothy, gives you control and power over your emotions. I decree and declare this is the last day you are going to be emotional. This is the last day that you are going to take things personal, especially if you have, if, have been called to someone who has been tasked to develop you into leadership. See, a position doesn't do that. A mentality, a mindset. Uh, I feel the anointing of God. I feel like someone is getting a breakthrough right now. Shout, I understand. I understand. This stage is, is about learning the principles of cause and effect. Allowing God to give uh, the mentor or the student or the follower, the person that is submitted to you, enough breath to show them if you do this, this is going to be the result. And it, 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 they learn through cause and effect, trial and error. Spiritually, it is during this stage that you gain a greater understanding of God and develop a greater sensitivity to purpose, potential, calling, giftings, and ability on both spectrums. The spectrum of the person that is in authority, that is charged to watch over the development of your soul, and then also the person that is, is submitted. So let, let's look at this flip side of this. So if there's two sides of this coin, the person that's in authority charged with developing you as a leader and helping to develop your skills and your abilities so you're matured, so that you don't go through life as an emotional basket case, refining your character, building capacity for the greater that's coming to you. But the person that submits, you don't lose anything when you submit. In other words, if the devil wants to attack you, they have to first attack the person that is covering you. Whoever you're submitted to has to be attacked first before he's allowed to attack you. The scripture says, smite the what? Sh shepherd and the what? Sheep scatter. So you've got to be able to wipe out the covering or wipe out your spiritual mother or father before the enemy is, is able to get to you. So to me, submission makes sense because it is, it is demon proofing my life. So if you want a demon proof, devil proof your life, submit. And so people really don't understand submission is not about someone controlling what you do. It's someone disciplining what you do. Now, to be disciplined is not the same thing as being beaten. When the Olympians are being trained, their trainer and their coach does what? Disciplines that. They tell them when to go to sleep, when to wake up, how far they're going to run, how much weight they're going to lift, and they don't weigh in. They don't have a chance to say, I don't want to do this. I'm tired. Does it take all of that? Why? Because that relationship is built on trust. So Pais, this stage, is driven by trust. Either you trust God with your leader or you don't. And the moment you decide, I don't trust my leader or I don't trust the process, is the moment you sabotage your own future greatness. You see how the enemy wants to set this up? He wants to set it up so that you feel you can jump over this stage and still be successful. Now, you might experience a certain level of success, but it will look nothing like the success that will come your way if you embrace this particular stage of spiritual maturation. And it has to be embraced. You have to come to a point where you recognize, I'm going to submit. And you submit. Submission, then, is therefore not only based on trust, it's based on loyalty. Are you going to be loyal in the process or are you going to allow someone to whisper in your ear, it don't take all of this, he don't like you, she don't like you, she don't care about you. It's less about the person you're submitted to and more about the process you submit to. It's less about the person and more about the process. Now, there is a tendency for a child to want to resist. How many of you have ever raised a 7 to 12 year old? Now, they're sweet when they're little, and you're their hero. But somewhere around 7, 8, 9, 10, uh, they begin to, to, to get a sense, I got an, oh, my own will. I don't, I don't have to be afraid of them. 
And, and this is when they, 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 they begin to resist. But you, you have to be steadfast. Let's go back to the Olympian, being disciplined. So we are not talking about beating someone and, and making them fearful of you as we are helping them to focus. We're, we're, we're moving away from fear to focus. We are, we, we, we are saying this discipline is to refine your character because your gifts will take you to the top, but only your character will help you to be sustained there. And so you're building character, you're refining their character so that they have the discipline that is going to sustain them when they get true power. Now, when it comes to authority in this payer stage, it's very limited. You take care of your body, you take care of your task, but you cannot weigh in as to what you do, when you do it, and how you do it. And you've got to be able to trust God in the process. Now, God wants you to be fully matured in the things of the Lord so that you can have full access to your inheritance. So if you jump over this stage, if you abort this stage, if you walk away from the stage because your feelings got hurt and the devil whispered in you, in, in, into you, somebody doesn't like you, someone doesn't care, and, 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 and especially in the church, because the pressure is going to come upon you, especially if you have relationship with the set man or the set woman in the house. There's always going to be somebody that's jealous of that. So they're going to come and they're going to start whispering because what they want to do is they want to take your place. So they want to move you out of place. Secondly, I've discovered, and I've discovered this, Ryan, most people don't have an authentic relationship, so they end up being jealous of the one that you have. Amen. So they, want, they, they can't believe that that level of loyalty and trust is there. People don't believe that anymore because you don't see it. You, you, you see people betraying people all the time. Husbands betray wives. Uh, sons betray fathers. Daughters betray mothers. Sisters betray one another. But when it comes to the realm of the spirit, we operate on a higher plane. We operate in the plane that is not emotional. It's covenant. You see, God doesn't smile on covenant breakers. And so if you, you've got to make covenant, you've got to make covenant carefully. You cannot make covenant with everyone. But if you cut covenant with a person, you've got to stick to it. Because God frowns upon covenant breakers. So you don't take people under you and cut covenant because you like them. You've got to pray, God, is this the one? Is, are these the people? Whoever I have cut covenant with can tell you I'm a covenant keeper. And that there is nothing that they can do that will make me walk away from them. Absolutely nothing. Why? Because I cut covenant. And this is why I'm careful who I cut covenant with. And my covenants are always verbal. So once I say it, it's like etching it in granite. And, 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 and even if the other person doesn't understand the value, I understand the value because it's a covenant that is not made just between two people. It's a covenant that's made between heaven and earth. Are you with me? I decree and declare you are covenant-keeping people. And I decree everyone that has ever cut covenant with you will never break their covenant. Amen. You know, your amen sounded very weak and suspicious. I don't know if you were thinking about all the people that broke covenant with you and all the people you broke covenant with. Should I be praying right now and ask God to forgive you? Amen. Let's hit reset. I decree and declare a supernatural reset. From today onward, I decree whatever you did in ignorance in the past, it's under the blood. But I decree and declare from today onward, you will be careful who you cut covenant with. And then if you cut covenant, you will maintain your covenant in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Shall I receive it? Yes. Now, this stage is a very important stage because it, it brings you through the maturation process so that you can have full access to your inheritance. And I'll tell you why this is important. 
Because your inheritance includes the blessings of Abraham obtained through the sacrifice of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 to 14, if you can turn there with me, please. It says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So to, today I decree Genesis 28, 3 to 4 over your life. I decree the Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may, may be a multitude of people and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and to your seed that is with you and that thou mayest inherit the land whereunto thou art a stranger with God gave unto Abraham. I release the blessing of Abraham and I decree that it's coming upon your life and I decree that as God takes you through this stage pais, of spiritual maturation you will fully embrace the process now the blessing of Abraham includes many things please write number one it includes intellectual property that means that you are going to be holding on to intellectual property and you're going to literally use that intellectual property to create wealth not just to make money, but to create wealth. You see, when you buy a McDonald's, you are buying the right to intellectual property. So when you buy the franchise McDonald's, you sign on the bottom line, and guess what? You don't get a building, you don't get land, you don't get a Big Mac, you don't get the hamburgers or fries or milkshake or the machine. What you get is the right to use their intellectual property represented in the Golden Arches. Now, why is this important? The moment you make the investment, a few million dollars, and you got the land, and you're built upon the land, and you buy, you go through um, uh, uh, Hamburger University, and all of that, right? And you graduate. They guarantee, within the first year, you will make all your first initial investment back, which is to the tune of a few million. You'll make it back in the first year, pro plus a profit. Why? Because the intellectual property draws wealth to you. Are you getting this? The blessing of Abraham includes intellectual properties. It includes trademarks, copyrights, recipe, secret ingredients, proprietary information. I decree that God is going to release the blessing of Abraham. Shall I receive it? You are going to have intellectual property that is going to draw to you the wealth of nations. You are going to own trademarks. You are going to own copyrights. I don't know if you're getting this. If I were you, I'd be saying amen to all the declaration. Amen. You are going to own it. And as you own it, you're going to use it like capital. You're going to be able to convert it into intellectual property. I establish it. I legalize it. I decree and declare that you will have intellectual property. Number two, it means that God will give you a name, and your name will attract wealth. The Bible said that Abraham was given a great name. He said, I'm going to make your name great. So when you think of E.F. Hutton, when you think of the Marriott's, when you think of the Hilton's, when you think of uh, uh, Stephen Jobs, when you think of Bill Gates, you think of wealthy people. And so even if you didn't have money, if you say Bill Gates is my friend, guess what? Every kind of door is going to be open. Every bank will give you a loan. Why? Because you are associated with a name. This is the year that you will no longer have to drop someone else's name to have a door open to you. I decree the blessing of Abraham is coming upon you and changing the value of your name. People are going to perceive you as being smart. They're going to perceive you as a man, a woman of authority. They're going to perceive you, per perceive you as someone important. Everywhere you go, when they hear your name, doors are going to be open for you. A red carpet is going to be rolled out for you. Everywhere you go, just your name. The other thing that is a part of the blessing of Abraham that's a part of your inheritance is real estate, prime property, networks, influence, influential relationship, 
character, profound wisdom, extraordinary, outlandish favor. Can I pronounce that upon you? I decree and declare that a part of the blessing of Abraham is extraordinary, outlandish favor. I decree and declare that the favor that is upon you is extraordinary and it's outlandish. It is ridiculous. The blessing of Abraham also is about scandal as well. And that's how God described it. It's scandalous. You know what a scandal is? You're not just wealthy. Everybody knows it. They smell you when you walk in the room. I decree scandalous wealth is coming to you. <laughs> yes. Extraordinary influence also is a part of that. And listen to this. Unparalleled performance. When I think of unparalleled performance, I think of the excellence that brings about the unparalleled performance. And I think of Dubai. Mm. Dubai is in a league of his own. Because what they do is unparalleled. I decree and declare you are in a league of your own. Your performance is unparalleled. You dot T's, you cross I's, you have a Six Sigma anointing. Write that down. You have a Six Sigma anointing. And it's not only on you and your performance, it's on your business. I decree and declare, and I speak into the womb of your business, Six Sigma. Write it down. Even if you don't understand, trust me, it's a good thing to have. You know, when it comes to your inheritance, it's not only the blessing of Abraham, it's dominion of a, a variety of kingdoms and systems and institutions within the realm we call earth. So today I decree Jeremiah 1, 10 over your life. The Bible said, see, I have this day, say this day. Set thee over the nations and over kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build and plant. Let me just say this. God's about to throw down in your life. Oh, yes. Glory to God. Somebody shout, throw down, Lord. Yes, it's going to throw down. But God has set you over the nations and over kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy. It means that you're influencing nations. You're not just influencing your BFF. You're influencing nations. That means if you influence the nation, you influence every system. The educational system, the defense system, the health system. You're influencing government. You're influencing culture. You're influencing entertainment. You're influencing everything to do with that nation. I decree and declare you will not abort this stage. For if you do abort this stage, it means you will never have access to the new realm of influence that God is moving you into. So I decree Isaiah 60, 10 to 22 over your life. And the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls, and their kings shall minister unto thee. Hallelujah, the kings are coming. Not only is Queen of Sheba coming, the kings are coming. And they're going to minister unto you. You know when a king ministers unto you, you know what that means? It means that they're transferring wealth into your hand. It means that they're setting you up to own God gold mines and oil wells. I decree and declare kings are ministering unto you. For in my wrath have I smote thee, but in my favor have I had mercy on thee. Therefore, I'm decreeing, thy gate shall be open continuously. In other words, when a gate is closed, you have no access. But when a gate is open, you have access. I decree and declare the access will not be denied. You are going to have access. Lift up your head, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting door, and the King of glory shall come in. Yes. The Bible says, uh, 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 they shall not be shot day nor night, that man shall bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, and their kings may be born. Lord, have mercy. For the nations, you know I'm decreeing and declaring it. Amen? I hope you're receiving this. Amen? I decree that the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. In other words, if they don't want to cooperate with the will of God, they're going to perish. They're going to die. Amen? If they want to thrive and survive, they better start blessing you. 
And you better be positioned to receive the blessing. I decree you a posture to receive the blessing. The Bible said, Verse number 13, the glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee, the fir tree, the pine tree, the box together. Now, I may not want a fi fir tree or pine tree where I live, but I do recognize that money is made from trees. I decree and declare, yes. glory to God, the trees are being converted to money. <laughs> glory, to beautify the place of the sanctuary, I will make the place of my feet glorious. Listen, thy sons of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee. And they're going to say, I'm sorry. And all they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet. And they shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Whereas thou hast been forsaken and hated, so that no man went through thee. Nobody helped you when you were forsaken. I will make thee an eternal excellency. I decree and declare the spirit of excellence is coming upon you. And when they see you, they're going to say your excellency. Amen. A joy of many generations. Thou shalt also suck the milk of Gentiles and shalt suck the breast of kings. And thou shalt know that I, the Lord, am thy savior and the redeemer and the mighty one of Jacob. In other words, the mighty one of Jacob. Why Jacob? Because God was able to change his name and nature. In other words, he changed his brand. He changed his name and nature. I decree and declare your nature is changing. Because you're in the process of maturity called pais. For brass, I will give you gold. For iron, I will bring silver. And for wood, brass. And for stones, iron. In other words, if you think you're living good now, get ready. Because God is going to get ready to overwhelm you. You know, having iron and having silver and having wood is, and having stones is really good. But he said, I'm going to replace it and I'm going to take it to the next level. And it says, violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders. But thou shalt call the walls salvation and the gates praise. The sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee. But the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light and thy, and thy God thy glory. Amen. Now, glory in scripture has to do with wealth and influence. So he said, look. A lot of people would rather run after wealth. But the Bible said, the gold is mine, the silver is mine, say the Lord. So when you get the Lord, you get the gold and silver. And it's the gold and silver that backs up and creates the value of money. So if you take God, you take the gold and silver, that means that the currency has no value. So why chase after currency when you can have the God of the currency? <laughs> Glory. The Lord, for the Lord shall be thine everlasting light, and the days of thy mourning shall be ended. Thy people also shall be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hand, that I may be glorified. A little one shall become a thousand. You've got to understand where God has us. Don't despise your, your small beginning. Don't despise it. Stay in the process. A little one shall become a thousand and a, small, and, and a small one a strong nation. In other words, even if you start ministry and you've got one person, God said it's just a matter of time before I turn you into a thousand. Yes, yes. The least members you're going to have is a thousand members. Yes. Amen. Amen. And then if you're small, if you're small, if you're at a thousand, God said eventually you're going to be a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in his time. Now, this is important for you to understand, and I'm going to emphasize it again. I'm emphasizing this because if you fail to embrace the protocol of submission, you sabotage your own greatness, and you forfeit future authority, wealth, influence, and prosperity. Say, I got, it. I got it. Lord have mercy. I feel an anointing. It's almost like a hush came over us. So let's go to our text and let's see if we can excavate. Are you getting anything out of this? Amen. The presence of the Lord is here. I just felt him enter. And God is doing something. He's breaking something. He's giving a, per he's, I feel like the Lord is renewing your faith. You lost your faith. You lost your spiritual mojo, but you're going to get it back. 
Luke 2, 42 to 52, 43 to 52. Luke 2, 43 to 52, if we can go directly there. And let's see if we can excavate this text a little bit more. Luke 2, 43 to 52. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind. This was the text that we introduce you to, the child or their son. We're talking about spiritual maturation and the whole world waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. So we're looking at their son. And if you go into the Greek, this is, this is not gester. This is not uh, tacton or tikto, excuse me, it's not tikto. But this is another word. This is pais, pais. And, it's, and, and it has a translation again. A, a person that is submitted to the discipline of their covering or their parent, whether the parent is natural or whether the parent is supernatural. So the child Jesus, Pais, tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph, his mother and father, knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. But Jesus had run off. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him because it was interesting. He was interested in destiny and purpose. Verse number 46, and it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him was astonished at his understanding and answers. But if you notice, he was gifted, he was talented, he, he had understanding, but watch this. And when they saw him, they were amazed. You've got to be careful when people are amazed with your gift and talents that you don't, you don't get, ever get in the position to believe that you're actually ready. You know, people are amazed with your wisdom and talented and you're gifted and you just go run off because you've got now the elders listening to you and people are wild. But they were amazed. I want to I say this at, at this particular point. You're going to have an amazing life. You're going to have an amazing life. And people are going to be amazed, but it's going to come based on your level of submission at this stage. The Bible said, and his mother said unto him, Son, son, why hast thou dealt with us? Pais. Why have you dealt with us this way? Behold, your father and I have sought thee sorrowing. We were worried about you. And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wist thou not that I, uh, ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. Verse number 51 is very important. He didn't run off and start a ministry. Because he's a pais between uh, 7 and 12. And at that particular time, he was about 12 years old. And at 12 years old, he said, I'm a grown man. I should be about my father's business. But his parents recognized that although you're gifted and talented, you got to come back home and submit. Verse number 51. And he went down with them. The word down is different from arise. To arise means to operate at a higher level. To go down means to operate at a lower level. So he humbled himself. He went down. It was a mentality. Yes, I'm gifted. Yes, I'm the son of God. Yes, I know that I'm going to uh, redeem the world. I'm going to sit at the right hand of the father. But I don't have to be arrogant about it. I can be humble with it. Because he knew if he humbled himself in due season, God was going to what? Elevate him. And so it was his will. You see, Pais is a position of the will. You do it because you want to. Now remember, nobody could beat you into subjection because that's slavery. But the a Pais simply means you're going to be disciplined in your will until you will to be submitted. You can walk away anytime you get good and ready. But you will not to walk away. No matter what is going on, you have fully embraced the process because you know what you have to lose. And this is why tonight 
is important for you to understand. You've got to weigh out the consequences. If I do this, what am I losing? Am I going to lose the blessing of Abraham? Am I going to lose the access to power? What am I going to lose? And the devil will never tell you the full story. He will never ever show you the consequence. All he wants you to do is, you're grown, you're a woman, you're a man. Well, you may be 40 or 50, but spiritually, you've got to go through this stage no matter how old you are. Unless we become as what? Children. So in the realm of the spirit, I'm not talking about you acting like a child as an adult. Because we agreed we put away childish things. But in the realm of the spirit, this is the mentality. You trust what God is doing. And you trust the person over you. So he, the Bible said, verse number 51, he went down with them and came to Nazareth, watch this, and was subject unto them. He submitted to them. Even Jesus understood the value of submission. Once you understand the process of spiritual maturation and submit to it, God prepares you for an amazing life. And when people that you, you knew in the past sees you again, they're going to be amazed at how you have grown, how you have succeeded, how you have prospered. You are going to live an amazing life. You are going to have an amazing family. You are going to have an amazing marriage. You are going to accomplish amazing things. You are going to meet amazing people. You're going to drive an amazing car. You're going to live an amazing home. You're going to raise amazing children. Children. You are going to go on amazing vacation. You are going to age with amazing grace. People are going to say, I can't believe that you're that age. And you're going to be able to say, what age? I'm only 21. <laughs> and you're going to be celebrated for being amazed. This is why the enemy wants to abort this stage. This stage is an important stage because you get to choose to cooperate or resist. You get to choose to cooperate or resist. It's all about recognizing the importance of protocol. So from this time on, I want you to think of protocol as how God conducts his affairs and the process that brings excellence into your life. This is how I want you to think of protocol. So when we talk about the protocol of submission, I want you to think of protocol as to how God conducts his affairs and the process that brings excellence into your life. It is the process that allows you to operate in an elevated mental space for higher levels of performances. It is the mentality behind any activity that gives you superior performance so that you excel beyond the realms of the performance of your peers and colleagues until you have distinguished yourself as the best and the brightest in any industry. This is protocol. Lord have mercy. If we could just get the protocol right, protocol brings you into the realm of greatness. It brings you into the realm of influence and eventually great authority. It requires the discipline of spirit, the breaking of will, and the refinement of focus. And even Jesus could not jump over this stage. Let's look at Luke 22, 40 to 45. Jesus had to go through this stage. And we talk about being Christ-like. I want to be like Jesus. That's all, I, I, my greatest role model is Jesus. I want to be like him. Yes. Yes. That's my greatest aspiration, to be like Jesus. So watch this. Verse number 40, are you there? Luke 22, verse 40 to 45. The Bible said, and when he was at the place, he said unto them, pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone cast, kneeled down and prayed. Now, this is important. When you're in the pie stage, people are going to be around you, but they may not recognize the process that you're in. They may be, they may be speaking to someone who you used to be, 
but not the person that's in the process. And I want you to stay in the process. Tonight, God, God, God pushes you into the pious stage. Say, I want to go. Amen. I want to go. I want to be there. I got to be there. You've got to be there deliberately and consciously. You, 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 you cannot be unconscious. You can't be neutral. You cannot be neutral in this process. You got to be active and present. You can't be AWOL. Your mind somewhere else, your heart somewhere else, but you're going through the motions. I decree and declare this is the last day you're going to go through the motions. Your heart, your spirit, your soul, every part of you is going to be a part of the process. Now, he withdrew from them about a stone cast and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it be, if, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my what? Will, but thy will be done. In other words, look, I don't really want to do this, but I'm giving up my will. Do you see that? Yeah. I could do something else. Because why? You always have options. You could choose to embrace it or resist it. This is your choice, but it's an act of your will. And no one can make. One of the things about me as a leader is I'm going to teach you. I'm going to give you options. The options is you decide whether or not you want to be a part of the process or whether or not you don't. Now, if you don't, I'm not going to treat you any differently. I'm just not going to waste my time. Nor am I going to waste my energy, but I'm still going to love you. Do you understand? I'm not going to control you. I'm not going to make you feel bad. What I'm going to do is to give you options. Now, this is your choice. That means if someone else comes who is less talented and less gifted than you, and they choose, I haven't chosen for them, nor have I chosen them over you. What has happened is you chose not to. Do you see that? When we grew up, my mother did not beat us a lot. In fact, I got spanked, and it was only a spank once in my life, and I'm still traumatized. <laughs> it was only once. I don't remember any other spankings. I didn't need it. I was a good kid, right? But I was also very strong-willed. And uh, I, I remember my mother saying, um, this is what I want you to do, and here's the consequences, and the choice is yours. So that means that if my siblings or even myself decided we were not going to obey, it wasn't my mother's choice to discipline us or to mete out the consequences. It was our decision. Why? Because she decided that she wanted to bless us. But we decided to disobey, and guess what? That means we chose the consequence. Do you see this? When you come to stages of spiritual maturation, you will learn how to stop blaming the devil. And you will learn how to have personal integrity. And you start praying the prayer that, that David prayed. Against thee and thee alone have I done. I'm not going to blame Bathsheba. Against thee and thee alone have I done. In other words, he admitted that I will to do it. Do you see that? When you begin to mature, if you want to take your personal power back, you've got to come to a place where you understand that most things that have happened to you is because you willed it. Yes. You had other options. Mm. If thou be willing, remove the cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will. He submitted, but thy will be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. You see the discipline now? You see the will being disciplined? You see it being born into subjection? You see how your natural man is going to fight you? Because the natural man wants to do its own thing. It doesn't want to submit to God. The spiritual man, your spirit man wants to submit. But your natural man doesn't want to have nothing to do with it. it. wants to do its own thing. Look, we could party today. It don't take all of that. Only to realize when you turn 50 and 60 what the partying has done to your kidney. What the party has done to your mind, your age, your body. Are you with me? So you either pay now or you pay later. If you pay later, you got interest. 
Plus what else? Penalties. Have you ever owed the IRS? The penalty is one thing. But that interest? And it's compounded. So you want to do what? To pay, and the payment is front and loaded. You want to load it in now. You want to sacrifice now. You don't want to sacrifice way down 50 years from now. You want to do the sacrifice now. You want God to re refine your character now. When you're not in the limelight. Because once you get up there and everybody's looking, that's when the devil wants to pull the rug. But the devil is a liar. We're going to submit, and we're going to submit now. And it's not always going to feel good. He had to pray through. And so at this stage, you've got to learn how to pray through. Not walk away. You've got to be able to pray through. And the Bible said he prayed more earnestly. His sweat was as it was, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and he was come to his disciples, uh, uh, and was come to his disciples, he rose up. Look at this. He goes down. But now after he fights and he goes through the process, what? He, he goes to a what? Higher level of performance. His performance is the highest of levels. And his greatest performance, and I'm using the word performance, but his greatest feat happened after this level of submission. Because this is when they, after this, they crucified him. And he became king of kings, Lord of lords. He split time before A.D. and between A.D. and B.C. He ushered the whole world from the dispensation of law into dispensation of grace. He descended to hell, took the keys from hell. He reset humanity's operating system. I can go on and on. He did his greatest feat when he submitted the protocol of submission. Submission, therefore, is not about inferiority, but superiority. It is the process that refines and matures in preparation for greater power. We've got to understand that when we talk about pais, the enemy would like to abort this stage, not realizing that your spiritual authority and your spiritual maturity comes when you begin to learn the protocol of submission. Submission is nothing about, has nothing to do with what you lose. It has all to do with what you gain. And today, I pray that this message has really been a blessing to you. And we will look forward to part two of Pais, because there's more to come. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you. You're opening up the whole protocol of submission. You're giving us an understanding of it, the stage of spiritual maturation and how our future success and prosperity and inheritance is attached to it. You are showing us the responsibility of mothers, spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers, even natural mothers and natural fathers. You're showing us the great responsibility of those that have been charged by you to create leaders or to facilitate leadership development. And a part of this leadership development is a part of submission that is attached to succession. If us as leaders don't have a proper understanding, we will do great feats, but another generation would not know about it because we will have no succession plan nor successors. So it's less about just the inheritance. It's about the legacy. Father, we know that an inheritance is what you leave, but legacy is who you leave. I pray, oh God, that we will be able to raise up the next leadership that will change this world. I pray over each individual that you will give us a greater understanding of the whole protocol that comes with submission. Pais.